You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome to Paleo Radio, live in studio, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM. My name is Joe Elder. I'm the Crunch Time, Jeremiah Bannister. The Crunch Time. The Crunch Time. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, that's pretty nice. Yeah, dude, it's brand new. I, I thought of it at the last second, and I said, it just seems so fitting at the last second to come up with Crunch Time. There you go. Yeah. yeah. MJ style. And it fits. Yeah. Yeah, it fits Absolutely. big time. Absolutely. So, welcome to Paleo Radio, fantastic show, <laughs> all things nice, all uh, things great. We've been very busy this week, have we not? Dude, we've been super busy. You weren't even in the state, Joe. No, I was on the opposite end of the country. You were over in uh, in the land of uh, fancy pants stuff over near Beverly Hills, L.A., oh, yeah. Bohemian Grove. Went to Bohemian Grove. Went to Bohemian yeah, Grove. Yep, yes. obviously. Me and David Gergen were there. <laughs> Uh, we had a good time. Please, please, everybody look that up. Oh. That was a uh, little plug That's there. one of the best. That segment, not going to lie, we, we don't talk about it, but man, oh, no. Gergen, and I'll, this is the only hint we'll give you, David Gergen and Alex Jones. <laughs> Alex Jones. It's a, it, is a, it is a perfect, it's hilarious all around. The whole thing is hilarious. Uh, yeah, you got to see it. It's a good show. And you can tell that uh, people weren't playing games. So yeah, check it out. Right. <laughs> For real. Check it out. <laughs> Anyways, welcome to the show, guys. I was in California. Yeah. We were able to uh, visit my girlfriend's mom. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. After that, uh, we basically hung out with them throughout the week. But we went to Ye- um, Yosemite. We ended up going to uh, L.A. And we ended up going to San Francisco, dancing on the steps of the full house, mm. house, which was great. It's beautiful, by the way. Yosemite. Yeah. Oh, Yosemite's great. Yeah, Yosemite. Hey, do you agree with... with uh, the hardcore right wing talk radio host Michael Savage that San Francisco is a cesspool and that it's just dirty and gross and rotten. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'd have to, <laughs> I'd have to challenge that call. I don't even know if I saw one piece of trash on the on the right. ground there. Right. You know, he's just a real elitist. Yes. Yeah. He's just like it's not clean enough for me. Doesn't he live in around New York? No, he's in San Francisco. Oh, he, oh he's, he's in San Yes, he's I in San Fran. Sa- Michael Savage is in San Francisco. That's the hilarious part of it. Michael Weiner is in San Francisco. Dude, wow. Yes. Airing out of Alcatraz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it ticks him off all the time. He gets angry. But, dude, wow. you had a really cool... I love the, the pictures that you shared. Oh, thank you. You had some really yeah. cool ones. And you had that, that, that one was hilarious, man, of you uh, dancing your way up the stairs. <laughs> The full yeah. house. Is that the full house house? That is the actual house. That the they actual did. one. Yeah. And then we played the full house music. You know, we went all 90s vintage. It was a good time. Uh, maybe we can share that on our Paleo Radio wall. So check that out on Facebook.com backslash Paleo Radio. It reminded me the dance moves you did. It reminded me of the kind of slick moves you had at Reason Rally. Ah, yes. When you did the, what's that dance move you have? What's Wacky that? inflatable arm flailing tube man. Yeah, it's right. It's a family guy reference. It's- yeah. <laughs> Yes. Or a reference to just basically small businesses around America everywhere. Yeah. Like, the inflatable tube man. Dance, yeah, a Cadillac, is, c- Cadillac yeah, companies. It, it's top notch. It's something it's, that, yes. I, you know, you've seen it done in places as, <laughs> All uh, over. as prestigious as the Oscars. <laughs> it's, it's, well, what do you think is more prestigious, that or, or the Statue of Liberty or Uncle Sam twirling a sign? Ooh, Which man. one's fancier pants? It's probably fancier pants to be the sign twirler because it's a real human. But I don't know. That's a that's a very good question. Plus, you can mix in different kinds of dance moves that the inflatable tube man just simply can't. I mean, no, he's really restricted. Can't. But you have the unpredictability, kind of the <laughs> Schrodinger's cat style of the uh, arm flailing tube man. You just don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> what is he going to do next? Sunday was fantastic for me. We had an awesome time at Cafe Inquiry. Yeah. It was totally amazing. We had the people from uh, the Micah Center. We had a woman named Allison. She's the director of the Micah Center here in Grand Rapids. She came and she talked about the the Day Without Immigrants protest and about just immigration in general. She talked about the process, right? Yes. Like, what does it take? What are different categories? You know, how how are they prioritized? Where are they at in in filing? 
in different categories. How far back are they year wise? How backdated are they? Yeah, how backdated, right, right. Mm-hmm. So she was there, talked about that. We had over 30 people in attendance, which is fantastic. The most we've had since I took it over in September was the, the high watermark line we've got so far is 47, which is three behind Richard Dawkins. There Richard Dawkins brought in 50 people 50. to Cafe Inquiry. And I brought in, under our leadership with this, in direction with this, we brought in 47. So we're on your heels. There you go. And we're getting closer all the time. But we had it. It was so much fun. And uh, and really, the whole, all this past week was fun. I mean, obviously, it sucks because I'm still dealing with my butt sprain. Yeah. I mean, that's Sprain butt, that slows everything down. Oh, it, it slows everything down. It makes it uncomfortable to even sleep, bro. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just not even pleasant sometimes. But I, I had to deal with that. That's a real pain in the butt. Uh-huh. And then... My my son, uh, he turned ten. Ah, Athanasius. Yes. So I bought him a pair of shoes. And we we had to delay. We had to delay his party because of the power outage, and so because we were one of thousands of people that lost power during this huge windstorm, it was nuts uh, here. While you were gone, oh yeah, yeah. While you were yeah, gone, we had a massive windstorm, that. Joe. Yeah, it was huge. Thousands out of power. We had, we had no power for like thirty hours. So we had to delay his party until this weekend. So we had a house this weekend loaded up huge with uh, young dudes and a young a young lady that he invited to his party. Ooh. It's true, dude. Yeah, there you go. And it's it's because she's she's the the baller on the team. Of course, she's she is the she's the point Ms. guard. Hoops. Yes, and I told her I said you know I I'm excited to see this girl. I told her this. I said I'm excited to see you grow up and continue to play because she's one of those people that when she makes a super amazing shot, she she knows it. And mm-hmm. she'll turn around, she's like, yeah! And she's thumping her chest and, <laughs> you know, swinging her fist and everybody's yes. high-fiving her. She's fun to just watch. And so he invited her over. It was a, a fun time, but boy, man, that's a lot of a lot, that's of a, lot of, a lot of young frenetic movement gestures. It was a whole bunch, man. It, I'll tell you. But it was so much fun. So I had a great week. I'm glad to hear you had a great week. I'm glad you're back. You were safe. I held down the fort the best I could yeah. uh, by myself. Yeah, I think you <laughs> did a great job. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And yes. people who aren't doing a really good job are... House Republicans, Joe. Yes, this is a PBS article. Yeah, they're actually doing real bad. And this is this is scary. Uh, yeah, we have a couple minutes to dive into this, so we, <laughs> we're going to. Right. It's entitled, House Republicans Would Let Employers Demand Workers Genetic Test Results. This is by Sharon Begley, and again at PBS. A little notice bill moving through Congress would allow companies to require employees to undergo genetic testing or risk paying a penalty of thousands of dollars. It would let employers also see the genetic information and other health information of their employees. And that's really neat. It's, it's kind of like, hey, that's kind of like my secret code. It's yes. so secret, I don't even entirely know it. Yeah, everybody that listens to the show knows I'm a big science advocate, and I love that. But I, I'm really kind of into the voluntary genome testing, not the involuntary sort, especially by an employer. I mean, that's just kind of scary. Well, and it's hilarious because later in the article they try saying that this is a voluntary thing. The bill, H.R. 1313 or 1313, was approved by a House committee on Wednesday with all 22 Republicans supporting and all dem- all 17 Democrats opposed. Giving employers such power to this is now prohibited by legislation, including the 2008 Genetic Privacy and Non-Discrimination Law, known as GINA. The new bill it gets around this landmark law by stating explicitly that GINA and other protections do not apply when genetic tests are part of workplace wellness programs. And that's interesting. I just I didn't know you could just get around stuff like that. No, oh, yeah, that's a little loop de doo, isn't and it? And just be like this this law that would ordinarily not allow what we're doing where it doesn't apply here. You're like but and, it's a wellness program. Yeah, this is a wellness program. Yeah. Workplace uh, wellness. That's insane. Yeah, that's it. Mm. The AC allo- the ACA allowed them to change the employees uh, 30% and possibly 50% more for health insurance if they decline to participate in voluntary programs. This is included. Okay, so yeah. So yeah. the ACA, if you're, let, let's say that you're an employee and you are told, you got to, hey man, you, you got to uh, participate. Or, well, you don't have to. It's voluntary. But if you don't participate, we're going to charge you kind of between, I don't know, 30 to 50% more for your health insurance if you don't. Yes, and what they're doing, too, is they are kind of taking the the law 
that they put in for the voluntary wellness programs and putting it on steroids. Because the, the idea for the Affordable Care Act and the voluntary programs is typically included for, you know, cholesterol and other screenings, health questionnaires that ask about personal habits, including plans to get pregnant and sometimes weight loss and smoking uh, cessation classes. So that's what those voluntary wellness programs, and still in quotes, voluntary wellness programs are supposed to be about. They're not really supposed to be about taking genetic tests of people. <laughs> yeah, and, and each wild. one of those, each one of the situations that were brought up, I mean, not only in the article, the article brings up uh, cholesterol and other screenings, um, but stuff that you just said, you know, talking about smoking, for example. You know, these are things that uh, are bad for you, right? Not just simply your genes. Yes. Like, we're, we're talking about targeted things, things that if you do these certain behaviors... These behaviors are going to simply cause. It's not, well, let's just find out if you existing is going to simply do that. Well, and one thing, <laughs> like, to, one what thing we this? haven't considered, and this is me maybe getting Ugh. a little sci-fi here, but oh, yeah. one thing we haven't considered is that in the future, when we can run genome testing as easily as we can, that insurance companies are going to be interested in seeing what the probability mm-hmm. is of you getting cancer in the future and giving it to you then. So we may be looking at people being having pre-existing conditions literally out of the womb the minute they take a genetic test they say this kid has a 50 percent chance of getting a a type of colon cancer in when he's 40 years old so his insurance is going to go up today doesn't that have the feel of a death panel a little um a little bit a little like a little bit not not entirely but they're just kind of saying well well, the probability is you're gonna the probability but the death panel would be deciding to cover you or not and that's the whole thing about the ACA is everyone does get covered the death panel doesn't pull your coverage from you that's that's where the Republicans are missing their point. A death panel, it would be the Republican plan of we're going to give you a voucher, and if you pay over this voucher and your costs are more, uh, shrug, shrug and grin, good luck. I mean, that's a death panel because basically we've had death panels since we've had insurance companies. What is an insurance right. company if they don't insure you but a death panel? It's a death panel. Exactly. Yeah, right. they're saying, oh, you have a preexisting condition. No, thank you. I mean, that's a that's a death sentence for most people. You know, again, weight loss, smoking cessation, you know, things that things that are not necessarily good. Cholesterol, having high cholesterol, not very good. Genes, it's kind of what all of us have. Yes. <laughs> right? It's kind of uh, every single one of us have it. Right here it says, and in rules that Obama's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission issued last year, a workplace wellness program counts as quote-unquote voluntary – Even if workers have to pay thousands of dollars more in premiums and deductibles if they don't participate. Yeah, that's the whole that's the whole kicker with That's a real doozy. That's a real doozy. That's a double whammy. Yeah, having to pay for not being part of wellness programs. Double layered poop sandwich. We have to say it's true that if we want people to have a universal health care, it is gonna be a requirement that we'll start asking people to do things like this Mm -hmm. or pay penalties because if we're all paying in we all would be concerned that there is 20% of people who are smokers and getting cancer because we're all footing the bill for that. Or we would be concerned that someone's riding down the street without their helmet on their motorbike because we'd be paying for that. So, I mean, if you think about it, this is just a fact of the idea of universal health care. We would be considering those safety measures and telling people, "Yeah, we don't want you to take that risk because we have to foot the bill. So it, it is just a matter of fact that we'd have to accept if we took that route. And again, it would be behavior, behavior and it wouldn't sure. simply it wouldn't just simply be, well, we're going to we're going to bypass the behaviors and go all the way back to the root to your genes. We're just going to funnel through things. Yeah. And it's oh, like no. a fishing scheme. I mean, well, you're, you're you're kind of just fishing at this point. The employer a fishing expedition, the employer also to be even more cynical, could be considering how long you're going to be employed with them based on your wellness, which could be a whole nother mess. But stick around, folks. We'll be right back. 616-656-1680. Call in. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. We're totally verified. Verified is. Yeah, we're totally verified on Facebook. You got to check it out. Facebook.com slash Paleo Radio. All your dreams can come true. And, you know, 
Here's the thing. It's a weird. It's a weird thing. I, I don't know how exactly this happened. Right? It has to go back a long way. It has to. But somehow, Paleo Radio is a place. Yes. Well, we yeah, we're a place. We're, we're a, a place. Yeah, we're a location. <laughs> we're a location on Facebook for now, and so we we strongly encourage people. Hey, check in. Yeah. Check into us. Check in if you yeah, if check into Paleo Radio. If you're looking at what we have on the show, you're looking at our dank memes, or you're yep. checking out some uh, recent comments that we've been put on, or just contributing to the comment section. Uh, let us know that you're there. Check in. It would be great. It would also help us. You know, as we all know, Facebook is an algorithm, and the more you're mentioned, the better off you are. So if you like the show, you can really support us for free just by letting Facebook know that you're on our page and looking around. Yeah, so make sure to do that. Make sure to give us a call here today at 616-656-1680. Again, 616-656-1680. All right. We were talking about uh, single payer. We're talking about just insurance, health in general. What do you do with policy? There's a piece over here at the L.A. Times by Noam Levy. It's called Trump voters would be among the biggest losers in Republicans' Obamacare replacement plan. And there's a there's a an image here. I don't know if you can see it, Joe. Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, it talks about it, it's a layout of the country, right? So you have the contiguous uh, states here, and then you've got Hawaii and Alaska laid out. And it talks about, it shows where county-wise, uh, it breaks it down for who voted for Trump, who voted for Hillary. There's a whole bunch of red in, in a bunch of these states. And it says, counties where a 60-year-old customer making 30000 would lose at least 6000 in government assistance Oof. to buy health insurance under GOP legislation. The, the, the red part that says voted for Donald Trump, huge, huge <laughs> splotches of red all over the place. There's not very much blue. In other words, you have massive numbers of Trump people who are going to be penalized. Right? They're going to end up having to pay thousands yes. of dollars. They could lose it right? Yes. in government assistance uh, for buying these health care programs. It's, it's an amazing optic to look at and to see. So I encourage people to go check it out. Even just for the optic, you got to do it. Uh, Noam Levy, L.A. Times. Uh, according to a Times analysis of a county voting and tax credit data, Americans who, who swept President Trump to victory, lower income, older voters in conservative rural parts of the country, stand to lose the most in federal health care aid under a Republican plan to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Among those things hit the hardest under the current House bill are 60-year-olds with annual incomes of $30,000. $30, particularly in rural areas where health care costs are higher and Obamacare subsidies are greater. So, yes. yeah. so this is an economics question, right? Mm -hmm. You live in a place that doesn't make a lot of money because there's not a lot of people there or there's only one business there that's employing most of the city so they kind of have the whole marketplace gamed. So let's say you are. You're working 40 hours a week. You're making uh, 30 grand. You're still working at age 60. You're the person that gets more subsidies through the ACA than other folks. So those are going to be the people that are hit the hardest. So again, economics, Affordable Care Act is to help those people that don't have a higher income that are still working that have those high medical bills to pay and those insurance costs, those medication costs. So it's a, uh, it's a sad day where I think people have voted, in this case at least, against their interests simply by not really, maybe just not understanding all that the ACA entails. And um, I think the uh, individual mandate is something that really set people off in a way that made them kind of go, kind of go um, tunnel vision on the Affordable Care Act. They heard about the individual mandate, and they have to pay whether they have it or not. And I think that influenced a lot of people to hate it before they saw what it offered. You know, I know this is kind of tangential, but I I was wondering as it was talking about this, talking about people hit the hardest, people with incomes of thirty thousand, their older people live in rural areas. That it kind of—I don't know if it, if it's doing this or if it's just the way I kind of read it—but that it gives the idea that that is the majority demographic for Trump voters. But I thought, and I maybe I'm wrong, but I thought we talked back during the election about how it was a surprising study done. I thought it was five thirty-eight talking about how the the average was way higher, the average amount of money that Trump voters were making. Mm -hmm. was a lot higher than what people thought that they were just a bunch yeah. of very poor, uneducated people, but that there were a lot of people not highly educated, well, but that they were 
maybe people without that education that still made a bunch of money. Yeah. And what I would like to see, I'd have to look back into the 538 article, and now we're going to get real a little mathematical here, but I'd like to see if that was median income or if that was their average. Because the average, the average would, you know, if it was a median household income, then you can take a guy who may, who's making $4 billion, literally, and someone who's making twenty grand, and you're averaging somewhere in the middle of that to say right. that's what their income is. Mm-hmm. And that's just not necessarily true. If you look at the average of how many people are at that number compared to the height and divide it by the total, you would get a better number of it. It would well, be interesting to, look, to see. Honestly, we have to. And as I said, I don't want to go down point. a rabbit trail too no, far. But you do. You bring, you bring up a great point where I think you, it's definitely true that 538 released the article that said that the average Trump voter makes uh, quite a bit more than that. So in many cases, you could I, – I think – you do bring up a very good point because many of those people probably had their own private health care insurance plan that they liked in the first place, and that's that's why they and that's why were they, so outraged because they a lot of those people probably identified with Ted Cruz's terrible you know mock of a Jay Leno joke. What what was that? the one about? Well, you know, Obama told me you can keep it. Oh, yeah. you know that whole thing, and he and he told that same terrible joke in the same terrible way. Yes. in front of a bunch of audiences, over and they were all and recorded. And, and so, again. of course, you know, they, yes. they, uh, Vic Berger made a hilarious <laughs> 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 takedown. <laughs> yeah, Vic Berger's takedowns of, of Cruz were were just hilarious. But anyway, so those people they, they probably identified greatly with that and thought, you know, well, wait a second, you know, I had insurance. I remember I used to be with Dr. So-and-so, and I'm not anymore, and Obama said we'd be able to keep it, and I thought we'd be able to keep this doctor, and we simply couldn't. So it'd be interesting to know and kind of delve more into that dynamic a different time. But in nearly 1,500 counties nationwide, such a person, talking about the, the people, $30,000 and below, such a person stands to lose more than $6,000 a year. In federal insurance subsidies, 90% of those counties back Donald Trump. 68 of the 70 counties where these consumers would suffer the largest losses supported Trump in November. So if you, if you take the counties around the country that, would, that consumers would be hit the hardest by, um, 68 of those 70 voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah, it, they did. That's an interesting – and you know <laughs> – it, that's an interesting thing just to think about. And uh, part of the part of it is it has to be an admission. Republicans have to start really grappling with this, is that a lot of the people who do vote for them come from places that rely heavily on welfare and other kinds Always. of aid. Yes. Always. Whether, Massive. Whether numbers. it's ACA or not, you hit the nail on the head. Yes. Uh, food stamp programs, EBT programs, um, Medicaid, Medicare. This uh, That's rural – America that that uses those subsidies to act like it's the inner city, which which is a false dichotomy in the first place, guys. Like we we can't spend the last five minutes just talking about this, but just very quickly, the idea that the only the only people that suffer with uh, or have problems with wealth or have problems with um, financing or anything like that to say that's only people that are in rural areas or only people that are in the deepest inner cities is is disingenuous. I mean, it, it doesn't speak to the to how flux our nation is in terms of different sizes and scopes. But still, the point being is these these people really do use a lot, a lot of subsidies and a lot of government programs well saying that they don't like them. Like you, you remember the guy, you know, get your government hands off my Medicaid, mm-hmm. right? I mean yeah. that's that really happened. It's hey, a misunderstanding of the I of have the family system. members, man. I have family members that when Obamacare first came out, they were furious. It was communism. You know, it was all this Red Scare stuff going on. It was super scary. And later on, they got injured. You know, maybe they were skiing. You know, maybe they were <laughs> playing something and fell down, fell off, you know, fell off a roof somewhere and got hurt. And all of a sudden, they needed their insurance. And they, well— Guess what? They didn't really have any, and they were looking around. Boy, private insurance is really expensive. They don't really want to help you out too much. They don't want to help you out because, man, I, I'm coming to them because I'm hurt. Yeah. I have a condition here that and I'm again, dealing with. What's the death and they're like, hey, man. And so so all of a sudden, the, people start asking questions. Well, you know, this marketplace thing, or, well, how do I get it through the Affordable Care Act? And I know a lot of people, uh, and, I, and listen, I've been critical of the Affordable Care Act. 
I was critical from the beginning. Absolutely. I'm still critical me, now. Me well. You, you know, well. but at the am. same time, I know a lot of people who, even though they're critical, they also don't want it touched. That's right. They're mad they, about certain things to do with it, but at the same time, they're like, "Dude, I can go to the doctor. That's actually cool. I can yes walk in there and and not be terrified Absolutely. that I'm going to lose my home." Like many, like many social democratic programs, just like Social Security. As much as people talk about they, how they don't like the ideology of it behind the program, boy, do they want to keep it. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the thing about there's nothing wrong with being a political chemist. You know, there's nothing wrong with the idea of saying, I'm going to take certain aspects of first world social democracies in Europe and take some of what they do and uh, still look at good conservative countries that are, that are like, um, you know, you look at Finland or you look at Sweden that's extremely conservative in their practice and how they divvy up government. You can take a lot of good ideas from that too. It's the, it's the idea of not being open to either side of it that causes, I think, more problems than anything. You know, like Social Security is a good program. And it's a program for people that didn't put savings into their accounts or didn't have enough money to save and then needed help when they're older. Why in the world would we not want to help those people? And the same would go with the ACA where I don't like it entirely. I think the individual mandate's kind of a tough thing to get around. But at the same time, I understand having to have everyone pay in to take care of everyone. It makes sense. Interestingly, higher income younger Americans, many of uh, who live in urban areas won by Democrat Hillary Clinton, stand to get more assistance in the Republican legislation. Faring best, and this is relatively predictable with Republican legislation, sadly, faring best would be the nation's wealthiest residents. Of course. Who would see a substantial tax cut with the elimination uh, under the House GOP bill of two levies uh, on high income taxpayers. And so, in fairness, and this is in the article too. The House Republican plan would benefit older, lower-income consumers who currently get relatively small subsidies and live in parts of the country, including areas like Boston, New York City, Kaiser, and that's according to Kaiser data. Mm -hmm. So there's certain certain places, right? It would also help middle-income Americans who make more than $48,000 a year, right? People who – these people currently don't qualify for assistance under Obamacare, but under the GOP plan, consumers with incomes as high as $114,000 – could get subsidies. Uh, those subsidies are smaller for people making between seventy-five thousand and one hundred and fourteen thousand. So I encourage you go check out the article. Trump voters would be among the biggest losers in Republicans' Obamacare replacement plan by Noam Levy over at LA Times. We'll be right back with more Paleo Radio. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. Welcome back to Fantastic Live Radio here in studio in WPRR. Uh, Joe Elder with Jeremiah, and this is true. Paleo Radio. It's true, it's true. It is. Boy, had a uh, turtle do a lot of eating last week, <laughs> eating of uh, some foreign substances. Oh my gosh, this is over at Sky News. A turtle named Bank has How 915 funny. coins removed from his stomach in Thailand. It's by Sunita Patel. Uh, car stairs. And I, I was wondering... I don't want to. I don't want to pronounce it wrongly, but but it's spelled C A R S T A I R S. So like, it's like car stairs or cars tears. Yeah, like, cars car stairs. It looks <laughs> it looks like, like car stairs. Cars and stairs. Car yes. stairs. And so if it is, I, it's just an interesting name. I've never seen a name spelled out that way. So I hope I'm pronouncing it rightly. If I'm not, I'd be interesting to see how uh, that's pronounced. All right, the 25 year old female uh, talking about the the turtle spent years swallowing the money thrown into a pool in a park in Thailand by tourists. Now, just already, just that sentence, Joe, is a problem. Yes. I mean, why are people throwing money into a pool with turtles? Because they're superstitious and relatively ignorant. Oh, yeah, right there. They say tossing a coin into a fountain will bring you good luck. Uh, But it's quite the opposite for a sea turtle. Oh, yeah, good, sea turtle. Which had uh, to have 915 coins removed from its stomach. 900, almost 1,000 coins? Almost 1,000 coins That's for this bugger. And, people. you know, I remember when, when the mall in Battle Creek, there's a, there's a mall there called Lakeview Square, and they used to have one of those penny fountains. I used to see them all over the place, Joe. Yeah, oh, of course. But the penny fountains are, are just... They're fountains. just penny fountains. There's, there's, no, not, there's no animals swimming around in them that you're... There's no endangered or protected species in there. Oh, man. Yeah. I heard about this story on the radio when I was in California. 
Yeah. I, and the guys that were talking about it, the one guy said, man, that's a dumb turtle. And he, That's a and dumb he just, monkey. He was going after the turtle. Wow, what a dummy. <laughs> for, the, for the coin. What eating. a dummy. Oh, yeah, what a, what a foolish turtle to try to eat things in its environment. How dare. How what dare a foolish turtle. ape with, with I, you would hope, uh, cognitive abilities. That's right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Might exceed. Anyway, uh, a green sea turtle. Uh, and this sea turtle, by the way, his name is uh, Amson, nicknamed Bank. A green sea turtle can live up to 80 years and is listed as an endangered species by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Which, again, you, here you've got an endangered species and you got it in a, in a pool in a park. Getting pennies flicked at Getting it. Getting pennies flicked at it. What in the world is this? Uh. The array of currencies eventually formed a heavy ball in her belly weighing 5 kilograms. That's 11 pounds. And eventually cracked her shell, causing a life-threatening infection. That's a huge thing when that's when their when their shells crack. Yes, that's a big time problem. A seven hour operation was done with a wow. specialist from the veterinary surgeons that had removed a few coins at a time. Wow, dude, that seven, seven hour hours operation to save this turtle <laughs> because people wow. are superstitious. There's yes. no other reason. No other reason. Yeah, and it, the turtle was found in the eastern town of Sriracha. I I had to put that in there, man. Sriracha. We're talking the sauce, man. Yeah. We're talking rooster sauce. That's the the good sauce. Yeah, this is the good sauce. This is the, this it is the is. stuff that really I mean, matters. That, that stuff changed my life, Joe. I think Nathan, the voice, one of the voices here yeah. on the show. Shout and, out to the progressive rebel. Here. To the progressive rebel. To the, yeah, the 21st Century Bill of Rights. That's right. Yeah, yeah. it's his new check thing. You got, you got to go chance. check it out. A big shout out to that guy. Um, you know, but... Sriracha. Now I put it in everything, Joe. Sriracha? I put it in my I put it in my salsa. I'm like, oh, the salsa's uh, hot. Yeah, right. Watch this. That's and right. Put sriracha in there. My mayonnaise. Oh, it's just not spicy enough. We put sriracha in there. That's right. It's basically on everything. You know, lollipops, popsicles, fudge bars, anything you can think of. Anything. Ketchup popsicles. Ketchup. Won't glove. I want my birthday cake like covered in oh. sriracha sauce. <laughs> yeah, that I love it a something. lot, dude. I, I take it to another level. But a 3D scan revealed that Bank, the, the turtle, had two fish hooks inside as well. So, I mean, this is just garbage. This is terrible. So I'm not even going to try. Well, why not? Uh, Rungraj Thanawan Gnuvej. And that is a boy. That's a, a big one. I'm going to spell yeah. this out for everybody just to say this is what we deal with. Yeah, for, right? anyone, laugh, <laughs> for anyone laughing in their car, we'll just post yeah. this name. We'll post yeah. these names and these articles up on our wall on Facebook. And you can check them out and try to read them out yourself. I mean, this is just – yeah. I'm not even going to spell it out. I <laughs> the mean, it's price like 30, we pay for trying to be worldly. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. So, yeah, Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Science at another long one. Let's see. Chula Longcorn said in a statement, quote, and this and Joe, this is under my craw, dude. I'm just this is a warning in advance that what you're about to hear, at least on first reading yesterday, just just oh, it made me so mad. So here you've got a dean of faculty of veterinary science, right? And you're like, yay! So here's the guy. The belief is that throwing coins into the turtle pond will make the coin thrower live longer. Mm. Throwing the coins is more bad karma because it's animal torture, bro, bro. <sighs> You are saying it's real still. You're you're still in the world where it's like, yeah, they believe that throwing it in is going to make them live longer. What they need to do is there's a different place up the road that has a well, and that one's the real one. Why not just come out and say that, dude? Yeah. Because you're like, just don't throw it in this one because this yeah. one will actually result in the bad magic coming your yeah, way. Yeah, his idea is – I mean, it's it's nice that he's on our side in terms yeah. of, yeah, we probably shouldn't throw him in, in there. In the end. Saying, throwing the coins is bad karma for you, and you won't live longer because you're torturing yeah. the animal. But he's he's completely negating the fact that it's woo-woo BS from the get-go. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like he just kind of plays into the game, you know, while you're yes. just saying the magic word's wrong. So this article, Joe, it caught my attention right away. It's by Tim Alberta over at Politico, and it's called The End of the Libertarian Dream? Question mark. Long on the fringes of American politics, small government conservatives were closer than ever to mainstream acceptance. Then two things happened. Donald Trump and Jihadi John making it really, really, really difficult. <laughs> For, yeah, making a little for libertarian for libertarianism, but it starts off in big letters. Justin Amash can't seem to concentrate, and that's what caught my attention. 
right? Our boy. Was right out of the, right right our, out of the gate. This right. is our guy. This, this is, is our yep, guy. He's uh, from our area here. He's representing uh, there in Washington for us. But the 36-year-old representative from Michigan who arrived in Washington six years ago as a self-described libertarian Republican is rattling off a list of concerns about the newly inaugurated president. But he's distracted by C-SPAN's programming. Uh, Mick Mulvaney has his close friend and colleague from South Carolina and a similarly libertarian-minded Republican is getting grilled during his confirmation hearing to become director of the Office of Management and Budget. Amash savored every moment of it. And totally true. Yes. I mean, you know he did. Absolutely he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he was he, loving it. Yeah, Amash was totally loving it. But the idea that, that uh, Mulvaney being even in that place— Right. That, yeah. that, that was in a, kind of this ascension of ideas that they can look at that and say, man, look at where we were 20 years ago. We were uh, 20 years ago. They were writing letters in mass mailing and stuff from Ron Paul <laughs> and his mailers. Like that was kind of the extent of the movement. Yeah. There really wasn't any movement before that. There was no – it was before the Tea Party, before any of the Liberty stuff, all, all that. We, where was it and where is it now? Exactly right. And so it seems great, but there's a huge problem. Yeah, and and like you said, um, this is into the article again. The ascent of Mulvaney to such a powerful position in the federal government, libertarians believe, proves that their ideology has invaded and influenced the Republican mainstream in a manner unimaginable a decade ago. Which in some ways I think is true, that you do – the influence is there. But there is, however, a complicating factor. Mulvaney's new boss is President Donald Trump. Yeah. In campaigning for the presidency, Trump frequently sang the same hymnal as libertarian primary rival Senator Rand Paul, warning against regime change and nation building abroad, decrying the allied invasions of Iraq and Libya, never mind that Trump initially supported both, right. and promising to disengage from a self emulating Middle East while reevaluating American involvement in NATO. Yeah. So it shook some libertarians, but not all. Yeah, not all of them. There were some libertarians who actually really supported him. I mean, one of them that was really open about it was Justin Raimondo. Yes. Uh, He was very open about it, very criticized by people, even who work with him over at antiwar.com. David Boaz, executive VP of Cato Institute, uh, he wrote, quote, The silver lining is that Trump proved you can win the Republican nomination and the presidency by criticizing neoconservative foreign policy. And for internal stuff, that is a big – I mean, I understand what he's saying – you know, but at the same time, there's not much about Trump beyond those things that are very libertarian. And even the things that sound libertarian that he was saying are not necessarily very. How much do you trust that Donnie's telling the truth? Right. Or President Trump is because if you think about it that way, it, it's a it's a better angle of looking at it. You know, the other thing, too, is um, President Obama ran on an anti neoconservative ballot in 2008 and he won in, mm-hmm. in a heavy way a big reason why i voted for him in 2008 was because he was talking about closing down gitmo and not having so many bases abroad and not wanting to get involved in these foreign entanglements uh that are over oil or things like of that nature so i think most of the american public is ready to have a change in foreign policy in terms of that direction so i think uh conservatives and uh democrats alike conservatives liberals alike they both kind of feel that way you know, Trump, Trump, when talking about uh, during the primary and he was talking about all the things he's going to do, and some of these are mentioned in the, in the piece, they talk about oversee a massive military buildup. He's going to, you know, bomb the daylights out of yeah. the Islamic State. He didn't use daylights. No, right? he didn't. He used an expletive. Uh, he suggested killing the families of terrorists. He expressed an interest in seizing Iraq's sovereign Same, oil. Just taking the oil. Right, the, just take I think it. that's the most yeah. dangerous thing he said. Advocated the return of torture, declared he'd eradicate Islamic terrorism from the face of the earth. <laughs> I said that in the very next line, says he advocates the return of torture. And I said, oh, wait, no, second, yeah. second most dangerous thing So there, there's said. a list of things out there. You <laughs> oh know, I mean, goodness. of course, you could talk about drugs. That's another one. You could talk about the, you know, his position on just a host of issues, I guess, even on abortion. Yes. It, they would differ on a whole bunch of these matters. And so on the one hand— um, libertarians are finding themselves in a place, in an environment where they're able to make inroads in power, right? They're able to find themselves in a situation where they're being elevated to prominent positions. And yet at the same time, your job in those positions is not to be the, the rogue person that you were 
as a representative or senator, your job now is to work for somebody and set in line. Yeah, and you have to you you have to play ball a little bit. So there's uh, that's got to be bittersweet. Well, it's going to really challenge the whole volunteerism aspect of uh, libertarianism in terms of if you, is it worth the is you know is it worth the squeeze right is the juice worth the squeeze we'll find out uh, call in folks six one six six five six sixteen eighty we will be right back with more paleo radio. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. Well, it's hard to call balls and strikes when you're drunk, Jeremiah. It is, it's totally. <laughs> I'm speaking from experience, of course. It is, yes. Oh, I remember it's the, it's when I, the hardest when thing. I that Pony League game and I was sloshed. No, and hey, umpire, <laughs> what do you think? What are you, drunk? Alabama cop says, yes, he was. <sighs> and this is Associated Press out of Priceville, Alabama, because, of course, oh. it would be in Alabama, which we love you guys. Thank you for listening. For people that do listen to us, we're now Out of Alabama. Through Spreaker. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. We have some mobile listeners. Oh, yeah. Big time. Um, but anyways, hey, umpire, what are you, drunk? At one Alabama high school baseball game, police say the answer was yes. WAAY-TV reports that North Alabama umpire faces public intoxication charges after he was arrested for officiating at a high school baseball game while drunk, which just sounds really familiar to probably some of my high school baseball games. <laughs> right. Priceville police say Derek Bryant was arrested on Monday with one inning left in a JV game for Priceville High School. Police were called after coaches said he smelled of alcohol. That's what gets me, though. I mean, like, did they just smell the booze? Oh, I bet. I mean, why? Yeah. I bet. Yeah, they just, they smelled he it. That was, was it. I have a I have an image in my head of, like, Ugh. a cartoonish umpire with, like, the green stinks. Flies are buzzing, and they stop and just <laughs> drop out of the air. You know, one of those guys. But yes, drunk umpire. Now, here's the thing. In the MLB, with some of the calls that people have seen before, they would believe those officials are drunk. But nay, they actually are not. <laughs> Nay, they actually are not. And I, I just got to wonder, I would love to see if there's any video. We got to look this up. Way TV. Look up W-A-A-Y TV and, and the report in Alabama of an umpire, a drunk umpire. We have to see if there's any video of this because there's no way that it all just came down to the smell on his oh, breath, and he, Joe. And please, please have him walking off the field talking like Randy Marsh from South Park. So this was America. This is America? This is America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If, if that's the case, it will be the best video of all time and already win the 2017 Internet Award. Yeah, it, it will it will replace the the video that won uh, that had the guy following the KKK march with a tuba. Oh, the best. That was just bump, a bump, bump. <laughs> playing the circus troll. music. It, folks, if you want to troll, yeah. really learn how to play the tuba. <laughs> all right, let's go to the phone line right away. Jared in Grand Rapids listening on FM wants to talk about the alt-right. Welcome to Paleo Radio. Uh, hi, thank you for having me on. Yes, um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, members of the alt right uh, purposely misidentifying themselves as uh, libertarian. Um, I'm not so much talking about uh, politicians who claim they lean that way or different business members who have ascended uh, to the administration. I have, you know, obviously I have thoughts about that, but um, I've, I've noticed just a ton of people from all sorts of different, uh, not very popular um, in, in the mainstream, uh, such as the alt right, um, calling themselves libertarians. Like, and I feel that they're doing so because they're ashamed of their the true label associated with their actual beliefs. Um, in my opinion, if you supported Donald Trump, you, I mean, there's no possible way you could be a libertarian. Donald Trump is extremely dangerous to every single uh, founding principle of this country as far as freedom goes. And uh, I, I just generally feel like these people are, are calling themselves libertarian because they can't, you know, uh, stack up, so to speak, and uh, admit that they're a member of, you know, the, the white nationalist alt-right Sure. I, I've got a question for you, Jared, and maybe sure. this is kind of my interpretation of it. See what you think. But 
Do you think that some libertarians just looked at Donald Trump as a guy where they thought he could slash and burn enough things that it's not exactly what I like, but it's it's getting it's closer to what I've wanted than anything else in terms of them just knowing that even if he's even if he goes in there and drops like a meteor into politics, that that divot that he's creating is a divot that they want. So do you think that some libertarians just wrote it out thinking, hey, he might slash some budgets that I like and that's why they voted for him? Right. Um, you know, inevitably, there's going to be some overlap uh, with him, like, you know, eliminating one department or another that um, a libertarian is going to agree with. And I, I did notice in the run up to the election, there's a um, unfortunately, there are uh, there's a decent chunk of people that are actually involved in the Libertarian Party that um, I would attribute uh, the term evangelical to. And uh, so Gary Johnson wasn't necessarily that appealing to him. They they would call him a social justice warrior, um, you know, for just saying, hey, let's just uh, keep gay marriage. It's easier to do that than abolish it altogether. Yes. Um, and, you know, that, that offended them. And I think Donald Trump uh, kind of appealed to their, their inner evangelical uh, self um and and i think those people um were deciding hey i might vote for donald trump instead of uh gary johnson Mm -hmm. and you know you're what you uh said like right before i responded to you that definitely is it definitely happens to to a certain extent you know i i was thinking as i'm listening to you guys and i'm i'm going back and i'm trying to think of individuals who uh, would I would be found maybe on the alt right or at least kind of more nationalistic or conservative and not not so much libertarian philosophically who've kind of embraced and I've thought you know just even over the last decade I remember when uh, Glenn Beck made that switch and uh, you know I remember kind of during the the heyday of the liberty movement kind of when it first started where you get a guy who for years just mainly identified as a conservative he didn't really identify philosophically the same way as libertarian that he he claims to now kind of the pendulette style of libertarianism you know um but that uh you know people like alex jones you know he would be a guy who i mean anyone who monitors what he does or watches it uh it, they see a guy who on the one hand complains about the the drug war complains about the police state, complains about surveillance and all these other things that libertarians would. And yet at the same time, if you listen to him now, it seems as if there's very little that Trump can do that's just totally hardcore status that he actually ever complains about. It's always there's some there's some excuse to justify it because at, at core, he's philosophically a statist. He's not philosophically Absolutely. a libertarian. And, and so I think that a lot of these people who they're libertarian-esque – and every conservative is libertarian esque. That's why they align in everything, and they have coalitions the way that they do. Uh, but that they've they've kind of, if they're libertarian esque enough, and they even if they're close enough to to people who maybe with the Mises Institute or something like that, or Lou Rockwell with some theories, that they just identify whole cloth as libertarian, and it and it doesn't have the stigma. Like you're saying, the stigma associated with it that the alt right does. That if they say, "Oh, I'm alt right." Well, that, there's – yeah, OK. Well, that's a conversation starter. If you say that you're a libertarian and people have to kind of listen to you and go, you're a libertarian, but you kind of sound a little bit like Mike Cernovich. You know, right. you kind of sound like, you yeah. know, Richard yeah. Spencer. What's up with this on some stuff? You don't really sound that libertarian on everything. And so I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think you're going to see a lot of that, especially with the way that the alt-right was handled um, during the election, the way that even even the way it devoured itself. Right, the way that they ate themselves alive after the election, all the way up through the ball. Yeah, what was that, man? What, the uh, deplorable. <laughs> the deplorable. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, Jared, we'll give you the last word, uh, and then we're going to have to let you go because we're running up on sure. an hour break. But, yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, I think it was very well put, Jeremiah. Um, it's essentially exactly the, um, the point I was trying to get across. Uh, yeah, I've, I personally, I've, uh, um, I've delved deep into the, the roots and the – philosophy behind libertarianism and i i personally i i'm not even willing to say like hey i'm a libertarian just because so many people are 
sort of muddying the waters. And unfortunately, our the our movement doesn't really have like a true philosophical uh, figurehead that we can kind of promote in, in the form of a candidate. Um, I think Gary Johnson uh, was like a good candidate to run as far as like being able to appeal to a lot of people. But I wish we sort of had some sort of figurehead. Like, like if we had someone like Ron Paul without the evangelicalism, uh, like that would be great. Um, you know, I, I just don't really have the answer to that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so yeah, much for the phone you. call. Yeah, yes, no, phone call. definitely. Really appreciate it. I wanted to say, you know, one thing, and I, I heard it come up a couple times in the in the call, uh, is the Libertarian Party. And I just I want to distinguish between the activities of the party apparatus and libertarianism as an ism and say those I would say those are just two very different things. Um, that you can be a libertarian and not part of uh, the movement or the co- libertarian community, if you want to call it that. Um, and so, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. And I would encourage him. I'd say, listen, all those friends that you have, share Paleo Radio with them. I'm dead serious. Share it and say that you talked about this issue and say that, you know, these guys, they had you on and they talked about it back and forth and uh, said some things that maybe they'd be interested in. Make sure to check out our Facebook page. We normally share our, our podcast, the, the show, on the same day of the show. We try to make sure to do that. So every podcast should be made available on iTunes and on Spreaker yes. and on your podcatcher on your phones or on computers yes. uh, sometime in the late afternoon on Mondays. But share it on Facebook with your friends for yes. sure. And for people like Jared that don't really want to go with the tag of libertarian, I, this may not be his cup of tea, but I like this. Um, when I was on an earlier show here in uh, Grand Rapids on WPRR, they dubbed me a libertarian which I thought was really clever because, yes, it's a contradiction, but at the same time, it's a great philosophical way of explaining my position, which is usually first question is, does government need to do it in the first place? Should it be even involved? And then the second question is, does it violate social norms where the government would have to step in to make sure that people are being treated at least equally or fairly? So anyways, stick around, folks. We're going to have a ton of great topics to be talking about afterwards. We're going to talk about Facebook flags. Russia has some perfect ammo. uh, Big beauties, bottled water. We also are going to be talking about procreating and if it's morally our duty to stop having kids. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a ton of fun. 616-656-1680 if you want to be part of the conversation. Again, 616-656-1680. More Paleo Radio coming your way. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Everybody, I'm Jeremiah Bannister. I'm Joe Elder, and you're listening to Paleo Radio. Uh, there's a guy, boy, oh boy, oh boy. I wish I remember his name, man. Oh, it's gonna kill me. I was watching a CNN uh, discussion going on about uh, about Russian hacking and everything else, and it was uh, McAfee. Oh yes, you know, yeah, and he, yeah. and he was talking to somebody, and I'm trying to remember. James. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the dude's name, the guy that he was being interviewed by. I ju- I was just watching it a moment ago, but man, that guy looked just cranked out of his mind. Did he? Oh my gosh, and- his eyes were just bugging so hard. <laughs> I was like, it's one thing to look like you're, you know, like in almost every single campaign propaganda picture, you know, where you've got a. a uh, a candidate who's in a in a picture at some kind of a factory talking to people in hard hats, and they're always looking very intently, like, "Yes, I'm listening yeah. to every word you're saying." Maybe turned and pointing up at something, you know? Oh, we're all looking at the yeah, we're all looking. we're looking at the roof. You're ex- examine it. So, like, I know what it looks like to look as if you're paying attention. All right, I've <laughs> I know I know how to do that. I practice in the mirror all the time, and so I know what that's like. Man, this guy, I mean, he looked like he was just. On alert, like he cranked it up to 11, alert mode. Just flipped it it on and cranked it up as high as it could go. And just amazing. So anyway, as I'm going through and funneling through this stuff, though, looking at these funny things, 
I see this this piece over at HuffPo. It's hilarious by LJ Quirk. And it's called Guys Examine Women's Products. Yes. And just reading the title, I thought this would actually be just kind of fun. And and listen, if anybody listening at this point in time during the show, if you're a dude, okay, we encourage you. If you're a guy <laughs> and you've thought of this stuff or you have experiences on this level, uh, or if you're a woman and you, you flip it on the inverse, uh, give us a call, 616-656-1680. We'd love to hear your fun stories, but it says it says this: uh, blenders, cups, irons, pa- pasties, <laughs> yeah, pasties, yeah. yeah, and chicken cutlets. These items are as likely to have a place in your kitchen as in your handbag. The vast array of items marketed to women are self admittedly ridiculous, but often necessary. You can keep your. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that. Yes. Uh, but you'll have to pry my. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave that whole last sentence. Yeah, we'll. So leave that <laughs> we'll one. leave it. Yes. You're fun, LJ. But yeah, yeah can't not gonna go there. Uh, we get so lost in the marketing that we often become blind as to how crazy these products might look when taken out of context. That's why it can be refreshing to take a step back and watch reactions from people these products weren't designed for. It makes it all seem a bit mad, a bit crazy. But yes. the first dude on HuffPo, right, says that ladies' feet don't matter to him. And I almost turned uh, off the video at that, at that point when he goes, oh, that's gross. Feet are gross. I was like, I don't know about this video. Yeah. I don't know well, about and, this guy. And the other thing, too, is when it, this is just another mention, but uh, we used to do a walk a mile in her shoes. It was a walk we did in college where you would walk in heels for a mile. Um, and it was basically for uh, to fight against sexual abuse and stuff against women. But boy, you do that for fifty feet, and you learn that it's a whole different world being a woman, and the amount of things for for beauty and standards that are applied to them in comparison to men is just wildly off. And it's just something to note that he says, oh, feet are gross. And it's like, you know, that's that's a whole different world, yeah. buddy. <laughs> well, and hey, man, I, I know what it feels like. I spent, an enti- I spent an entire work shift at Denny's on my feet. Third shift, by the way, yeah, right? So heroic type stuff. Heroic. Uh, just all over the place with drunk people. Yes. Um, but I, I was in high heels all night long. Lovely. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, I, my, it was Halloween. Oh, right, I was dressed up yourself. like I was dressed up like a. No need yeah, to explain. No need to explain. I was just wearing high heels that day. I was day. Just wearing I, high heels that day. <laughs> I just said, "Boy, I just you know, I just want to see how it goes." But they were talking about these different things, right? Moving past this guy and his ridiculous opinion about feet. The they were talking about this thing, uh, the exfoliator. No, oh, yeah. And I'm like, dude, I am totally down with the oh. exfoliator. I, I grew up in a home with a mom who was exfoliating. With exfoliating. Yes. And so over the years, I'm like, oh, look at that. I yeah. like this thing. This it, it makes my skin nice. Absolutely. They also have breast covers. I've never used one of those. I have not. What myself. are your thoughts? Uh, I, I, yeah. For people that want to use them, great. For right. people that don't, great. <laughs> Whatever you'd like to do. You know, I, I would know what they look like, though. I think some of the guys on there had no clue. Well, hey. You know. Yeah, and they also had a foot file. Ugh. Right. Now, the, the men on that thought it was a cheese grater. A cheese grater. Yeah. Uh, and then somebody asked, they said, would you sleep with someone who has calluses? And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you? How many men are paying attention to the calloused feet of their loved ones? Yeah, that they're really upset about that. Big into them, them feet. Well, and hey, I, I'm big into them feet. But all you got to do to take care of that business, there's... <laughs> I don't. I don't want to put any. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go ahead and uh, uh, do any endorsement of any kind of products. But man, I'll tell you, there are some. You just a couple days, slap some of that stuff on the ladies' feet, and it's super, super soft. Good life. And not just the ladies, man. I put it on my feet, and my feet are super soft too. There you go. It's true. There's also pasties, which men got to <laughs> learn what those are about. Keeping I have those in my in. in my bag. And, and then contour kits. Contour kits. Yes. Yeah. That was actually yeah. a tricky one. Uh, a lot of the guys had no clue what that was. Mm. They don't even know what contour is. They, they don't mm. understand how that plays into makeup. You know what that is? Yeah, it means those are men who are being fooled on the daily. Yeah, fooled on the daily. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what's what. <laughs> if you've uh, got a funny story, we would love to hear, you know, if, if any of these things. And listen, I mean, some of these, uh, you may have a, a different opinion about feet than me. I respect your right to have terrible opinions. Uh, but you're welcome <laughs> to give us a call, 616-656-1680. That's right. And but, speaking yeah. of terrible and opinions, uh, right. do humans have a moral duty to stop procreating? This is a big one. And this is over at Big Think, isn't it? Yeah, this is a Big yeah, Think Yeah, it's article. a Big Think article. 
article. It's by Natalie Shoemaker. What's up with this whole car stairs, shoemaker? Car stairs, shoemaker. What's up with this, I'm man? I'm not sure. It's just it's in the water. Um, <laughs> apparently. So th- this is this is just basically trying to tackle the idea of what do we do with human overpopulation? Mm-hmm. And she says, whenever any animal population gets out of control, whether it be an overrun of deer or geese, humans usually step in and make plans to curb it through hunting or damaging nests. It seems cruel, but without a natural predator to bring the population down, overpopulation could have devastating effects on local environments. Yet humans have shown themselves to be far more destructive than any other animal on this planet. So why do we offer ourselves the same consideration? Or why don't we offer ourselves the same consideration? Because everyone... No, let me take this back. Let me not let me not be so broad. Oh, go ahead. 99.9% of humans love the tang. Mm. They love the poon. They do. They They're do. Quite fond of and it. In fact, it's just it, it is an inevitable thing that you that the vast majority of people that opened their eyes and didn't ask to be here, but opened their eyes to it, that at some point in their life, chemicals will start dispersing throughout their body that will make them wake up a little bit happier than they're accustomed to. And those mm-hmm. people in the morning, yes. right, they're going to have certain sensations. There's nerve clusters, man. Do you think You're it, born with those. But do you think it has to do with the fact that, like, people talk about the policies of China, the one-child policy, saying that that's, you know, ridiculous. How could you do it? But China's talking about they have a sixth, a sixth of the world's population in their country. Mm. I mean, what do you – at some point you have to – don't we have to start thinking about – overpopulation and use of resources and how do, how do we do this especially for people that are in I'm I'm looking at you first world nations that can control your uh, pregnancies and can control childbirth a lot better than other areas um, what are what is their responsibility in terms of overpopulation um, I think it opens a lot of interesting questions but this is this is talking about anti-natalism here right I mean this is in a way that's what people look at it you're anti-baby to be doing this um, it's a philosophical position that opposes procreation. The planet is overpopulated, and we're consuming more resources than the Earth can reproduce. You may not know this, but last week featured Earth Overshoot Day, the day when the Global Footprint Network announced that we've consumed a year's worth of resources. So think about that. The last week, we've already beat our year's worth of resources. The GFN estimates that first overshoot day may have been back in the 1970s. Philosopher David Benatar, author of the antinatalist book Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. Wow, that's a harsh book cover name. A Written by a dream. guy who felt it more worthy to write that book than to just kill himself. That's right, ironically enough, yeah. isn't it? He wakes up every day and says, well, I know it might be better if I just wasn't here, but you know what? I'm going to keep on making it difficult for everybody else around that's me. That's right. <laughs> if that level of destruction were caused by another species, we would rapidly recommend that the new members mm-hmm. of that species not be brought into existence. It's important to note that antinatalism, while favoring human existence or while favoring human extinction, I guess, is a view about a particular means to extinction, namely non procreation. Antinatalists are non committed to either suicide nor speciocide, as some of their critics intensively suggest. Uh, nothing is lost by not coming into existence. By contrast, ceasing to exist does have costs. So there, he, I think he went after uh, your preposition. <laughs> yeah, it, nothing's lost by never coming into existence. Oh boy, that to me is kind of like a Buddhist cone. Mm. I I think it's a little wooey. I, I think a lot of things are lost by not coming into existence because we attribute things in existence to people who came into existence. We attribute science and technology to what people do, things that allow people to live longer or help to get rid of things. That Those things don't pop into existence by themselves. But very rapidly, we may not be the ones who even drive that anymore. I mean, if you look at 100 years from now, it may not be humans that are leading the way in science, technology, engineering. It could be, it could be artificial intelligence. I know some people laugh about that, but I mean, that's a true statement. When we look at the jump of artificial intelligence, why can't – who is to say that a, a degree in philosophy is going to protect you from an artificial intelligence? They, they'll be better at that. We could be looking at 100 to 200 years from now where humans are not the leader in innovating practically anything in terms of new things for engineering. And if that's the case, what do we do with all these other people? 
I'm pointing out that if something can be gained by coming into existence, then something can be lost by not coming into existence. True, but also In the, it, yeah. also a mini a mini great excess of nothingness comes from procreating, though too. Let's be real, folks. There's um, Bill Burr has a whole stand up set where he's joking about quit making that guy that doesn't know what he wants in line ahead of you. Like, why are we keep making that guy? Why is he still around? And it's it's a joke. It's a jokey way of saying that there's so many people that aren't really doing anything that what is what is the meaning of pumping out eight kids? Why? What is what is the what is the grand get you that you're netting from that? In opposed to how many resources are they taking up that needs to be shared amongst other people? It's a big question as to who, Very big who question. says, who's on the outs, who gets the drop, poor countries, first, first world. We'll talk about it when we get back. Much, much more right after this. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Tons of awesomeness right here, Joe, for the yeah, show. Tons of awesome. Tons of awesomeness. And you got to go. Listen, I had somebody ask me recently. They said, uh, they said, is there any way I can listen to the show? Like, if I, like, I, I, what time does it air live? And I said, if you don't listen live, okay, because they were afraid. They work during the day. There's no way, right, in the workplace setting that they would be able to hear the show. I said, go to our iTunes. Yeah. Oh, Go yeah. there and, and check it out. Check out iTunes. Check out Spreaker. Yeah, and check it, out Patreon. Check out Patreon, there. yes. Find us there. Find us on Twitter. Find us on Facebook. Find all the different goodies that we're blasting out to all of the paleo radio divas around the country uh, here. Not just on Mondays from 10 to noon Eastern Standard Time, but all the time. Oh, yeah. All the time. We're very active on social media. We love we love the messages. We love the comments. And we will engage with you. You guys can just come to the page and talk to us anytime. Now, speaking of talking with us and engaging, 616-656-1680. That's the magic number to get on the show. Uh, Angela's going to be in the call room for about another 15 to 20 minutes. So if you, if you want to hear her magical voice and you want to talk to her, uh, you can give us a call, 616-656-1680. Otherwise... You got to deal with somebody else. But this article, man, Facebook, and you know, there we go again, Joe. Facebook, man. Facebook making Facebook. Making ugh, Facebook begins flagging, quote, disputed, and in parentheticals, fake news. This is by Jessica Goyne, is again, G U Y N N. You can follow, you can go check her out on, uh, on Twitter at J G U Y N N. Uh, and that's, she writes over at USA Today. So, Facebook began flagging fake news, or as Facebook calls it, disputed news. A warning label is being slapped on articles that clearly have no basis in fact or reality, at least some of them. The giant social network first promised to roll out a disputed tag in December. Over the weekend, it made its debut in the U.S. Facebook declined to comment, though. The giant social network first promised to roll out a tag back in December and, as I said, rolled it out. Now, here's the thing. Is that a lot of these a lot of these fake news sources are ones that we all know are there, like the Seattle Tribune, for example. Sure. Like I think I don't know was the Seattle Tribune the one that got us. It was. I think it's the one that got me. It was. It, it did. So the Seattle Tribune that is a tricky little guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but Seattle Tribune obviously gone. Other ones are obviously gone. But one that's really been hit pretty hard. Um, interestingly enough, is also Infowars, and not just not just. Um, Stuff to do like with Freemasonry or, you know, Illuminati and stuff like that. But stuff like um, there was one that was uh, flagged uh, as disputed news. And it was uh, strictly an interview with Rand Paul over Obamacare and the re- the replacement of it. And that was one of the things that was flagged as, as disputed. And there's other sources too, you know. And so these there's a lot of people that are saying, wait a second, this isn't just fake, it's disputed. Yes. Like what is and that's actually kind of a broader term than fake news. Fake news seems like a really almost a, a decent term for it, like a specific well, thing. I think if you call it disputed, it gives you more wiggle room. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. If you call it fake news, then you're making a, a matter of fact statement that you have to prove. If you call it disputed, that's it. And you just, oh yeah, people have disputed these facts. That's it, and then you can just roll on. Now, wh- is this going to develop? Just basically devolve into us getting disputed tags on almost everything we have. Well, yes, but Facebook goes in 
And that that's the big thing yeah. is that because that is going to happen. And I was just I was wondering the same thing as it, you know as you were talking. I was like, wait a second. I'm like, you know, conservative people. They're going to take Huffpo all the time. They're going to take Huffpo all the time. It's kind of like when when you have a source, let's say Huffpo, for example, during the election, they would put some of the source, who do you trust more, uh, WikiLeaks or uh, mainstream media? Well, you'd get tons of people that would be activated on social media by, let's say, Mike Cernovich or others, uh, Pizza Party Ban or whatever, who would g- get people to go over there and it would just be this wildly disproportionate number. Uh, right? Yeah. That's how that's how Trump won every online poll during the mm-hmm. election. He won like every single one all the time. That that sort of a thing. So, you know, I kind of look at it and I'm like, you're going to have a lot of this where people are just going to say, "Well, I I don't like New York Times. We're going to activate a bunch of conservative people to go and just start flagging." Flagging it. And I, I think Mike Cernovich has already done that with Twitter. Said yeah. they've taught people and there's other people. I'm not mean to just poke shots at Cernovich. But there's other people too. And they're going and saying, hey, listen, this is how Twitter treats people, and they're going to they're gonna flag, and they're going to do this to people. Well, we want you to go and find um, you know, anything out there that you don't like uh, or that you disagree with and flag those people. And it, it also says, too, uh, BuzzFeed <laughs> News found that people who say they rely on Facebook as a major source of news were more likely to believe politically san- slanted fake news stories, which, duh, right? Yeah. But at the same time— I guess it gets into the responsibilities of people is who who's responsible for delivering concise factual news? I mean, it, truly, is it the responsibility of the the news sources or is it the responsibility of the individuals to seek out the news? Like what do, I'm asking this in a strict philosophical or ideological sense, like whose responsibility is it to be getting good information? The person that's ingesting it or the people that are disseminating it or both you know i would say both but i would say you know what makes this what makes this problematic for me and and troublesome is that facebook has such a lock on that market that's why that's why governments stay out of certain debates and they why free speech is a good thing is because they have a monopoly on on Censorship in that way. Yes. Right? So they really try not to wield that very often and just let them to maximize, always fall. In, in fact, it's uh, where you fall on the side, in fact, of mm-hmm. freedom yes. with this because, other, because it has a monopoly, because there's no competition for uh, the, the, the wielding of the sword. The one thing I like about Facebook here, though, is that they're not going to be the ones doing the fact checking. They're saying it to a third party. So it says how the article gets flagged. To flag a fake news article, users click the upper right-hand corner of a post. Facebook says its algorithms are also rooting out fake news articles. Um, Facebook says news, ar- news articles flagged by users will be sent to third-party fact-checking organizations that are part of uh, Pointer's international fact-checking networks. Now, that's the other thing is now we have to look at the legitimacy of that as well. I mean, no doubt we do. But at least it's not Facebook saying internally they're going to review it and uh, get back to you. Because I think that would be a little scarier. It's still scary already. I mean, think about, um, well, for instance, think about public reality radio stations that put on-air content. If people don't like it or they have a particular angle on the slant of it, they could report it as fake news. And if you're not a popular enough show, you could really face ramifications for that. Now, that doesn't mean just us here at Paleo Radio. We're talking about uh, Cut to the Chase. We're talking about Boiling Yeah, the F-bomb. Or F-bomb, I'm sorry. We're talking about... um, the boiling kettles. We're talking about all of local mm-hmm. programming that if you're in Facebook's algorithm and you're just not high enough, can you get a wave of people that just don't like your content that can shut you out of being dis- disseminated out on Facebook is the question. And it may be yeah, true. Well, these these groups, these organizations, like you, you talk about Facebook, you talk about Google. If you get locked out of those things, and I, I'm worried for some some organizations, and I, I find this interesting because it seems to be entirely political and not religious. Yes, you, you, absolutely. You can still you can be somebody who, who puts point. forward in in end times review of of. Well, I was reading the New York Times, and it looks like Russia's the bear, uh, and this is the beast of the sea, and the this is what the future is. The end times are coming, and that's going to be that's perfectly fine. I'd hate to step on anybody's religious toes, but if you disagree over historical narratives of controversy, uh, that all of a sudden, like that is an interesting. That's an interesting little little take there on that. It is. So I, I mean, I I find that very difficult. But if you have uh, if you have an organization 
that has been locked out of Google for the same reason, where they say you're, we're not going to do your ad stuff anymore. You can't you can't do ads on any other sites. You can't. We're not going to allow ads on yours. You're not going to get any revenue in that way. And if Facebook starts doing that, you're literally being strangled to death. It's your business you is done. You're done. Mm-hmm. That's that's worse than being some small business. If Walmart shows up next door, yeah. I mean, it's you. You're you're grasping for anything at that point. Where are you going to go? That's true. Th- those those that those webs those networks are so massive that to be locked out of that is well. And I think one one angle to this that I think we should we should really try to explore too is the fact that Facebook is trying to get rid of the the most egregious offenders. Which we know we know are egregious offenders, and which honestly, discourse and ideology and philosophical arguments will not suffer one iota by having absolutely completely fake memes disappear from Facebook. They, it's not going to kill your discourse. We're talking about the the one I saw one this week, man, that said ninety five percent of all homicide uh, warrants issued in Los Angeles are for illegal immigrants. Ninety five percent of them. That's BS. That's a crazy thing that should not be shared amongst all out. That's that's out and out not factually true. It's not mm-hmm. even close to true. It couldn't be. Literally mm-hmm. couldn't be true. Um, we're not going to be suffering from a lack of free speech to have that not be around. It's it's not going to kill us. It's not going to hurt us. Um, it will hurt us when if it gets into further deepening of these opinions, which is just like many things, it's a ball and it it's a rolling downhill, you know, the snowball effect, where what's this going to be in 10 years? That could be dangerous. You know, am I worried about what they're going to do today about rooting out just blatantly false narratives? Like the one of Donald Trump saying that if I was going to run, I'd run as a Republican because they're so stupid. And yeah. I, you know, those stupid guys, he never said that. Is the world going to suffer from conversational illnesses to have that removed from Facebook? I don't think so. But will it? Will it be? Will it be hurt by setting up um, groups and panels and people and policies that will enforce that? Like that's like if a hidden cost party, thing. Like no. on the one hand, it'd be good to not have that. It's not going to hurt us not to have that. But could it? Is it going to hurt us to even have the in, the infrastructure in place that does that? Are you going to have I, fall I out from that. I don't think so because, in my opinion, because I think it's when it's third party, you do get a a bit of relative responsibility there. If they're looking through Snopes and Politifact and all these other groups that that coalesce their information together to come to a finding, I I liken it the very same as I think the best system. And this maybe sound a little off, but in Canada, if a police officer shoots somebody, a third party reviews that it doesn't get reviewed by the p- canadian police it doesn't get reviewed internally a third party goes over that entire thing and delivers their their findings to the court and i think that that's the most legitimate way of getting to some serious answers but again five years from now if this continues what's that going to mean is that going to mean that articles from you know um washington post could get flagged as disputed what, what are they going to do with Vox? What Vox, with we, Vox? We covered a story where Absolutely. Vox has three narratives uh, that they're playing. And each time at the very bottom of the narrative about Russia and Trump, they say there's no public evidence available. There's nothing on that. The whole story was 100 percent that. Is that Sorry. fake news? Yes. I mean, yeah. So we'll be, be right quiet. back right after this. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Paleo Radio. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. Welcome back to Paleo Radio, live in studio, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM. Again, Joe Elder and Jeremiah Bannister. We're having a lovely conversation. We've been talking about Facebook flags lately and how that's going to yeah. The repercussions of Facebook flagging news. I just, news. Think it's, I just think it's so interesting, and I don't want to talk about this forever. Um, you know, but I, I just I find it interesting because of the limited scope of what they're talking about. In in some ways, they're treating uh, political news stories as if they're just – it's like scientific fact and that that's what news stories are for legacy mediums. I would, I'd be worried a little bit um, about um, privilege that is afforded and given to uh, legacy institutions, for example. If you publish a story that is entirely based on anonymous sources – how can you determine if that's fake news or not? 
And wh- how do you what do you do to an institution like the New York Times or like Washington Post? They come out with stories, and they have. And I, I mean, oh, this isn't lot. to malign them. This is to simply say, what is the actual playing field here? Mm-hmm. Is that a lot of times they'll have to pull back stories. They'll have to, uh, they'll advance a narrative, and then they'll advance another narrative on top of that, which then ends up getting blown out of the water. Which means that those narratives, when they were written, mm-hmm. were phony baloney sauce. Well, I mean, so are we worried that they won't? I mean, is that that is they'll be worried, given special? Is that they'll worried be, that they will not get uh, flagged? That they won't get flagged? Yes, because, because it's a legacy institution. Media. No, because it's a legacy institution, and that that it's a privileged thing. Isn't Washington it's, Post? I mean, they have a lot of conservative leaning angles, or the Washington Times. So or a lot of those, or the American Conservative. Do, do you feel like Washington? I don't know if Washington Times. Yeah, Washington Times would have a lot of a lot of those. New York Post would have a lot of those. I mean, sure, you could have. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see how it plays out. Maybe it's an unfounded fear. Maybe there won't be any uh, privilege in it. But this is something that on Twitter and on Facebook has been a problem that even Facebook had to address, inviting conservative people in and saying, hey, you know, if people make decisions. That's how we found out that people were making the call That's right. on, on the whole trending but, thing. And so if it's happened yeah. in other places uh, and that it just seems to be uh, something that whenever – Whenever stuff like this is played out because of – and we've talked about this – because journalism generally attracts more liberal people, mm-hmm. there's going to generally be a bias even if it's not the wringing of the hand swizzling the, the mustache bias. That's still think, going to fall in think, that direction. Uh, PolitiFact has a, has a bias? Yeah. Do you think that Snopes has a bias? Yes. Do you think there is no political fact-checking apparatus at all that doesn't have a liberal-leaning bias? Yes, because there are conservative ones. Which ones? Conservative fact-checking things? Yeah, that, that, Newsbusters. Are, that has a lean. Newsbusters would yeah. be a conservative-leaning one, as an example. Mm-hmm. Um, any fact-checking, I, because I don't believe, and, and this is something that, you know, when people talk about fairness and accuracy and everything else, like, I don't know, I don't know of many that come to the table as blank slates without their own biases without their own way of selecting stories without their own narratives uh, that they come to the table with to even decide on these things Mm -hmm. and people aren't Vulcans I mean we're not they're individuals they're people you know and they have their own I mean Snopes had to get uh, they pulled a bunch of stuff in fact they had to fire somebody after a long time with this person because this person was coming up with stuff that's just phony baloney nonsense. But then he got fired for being phony down the road. Yeah, their job is to do what? But how many conversations went on where people asked, "Well, you're doubting Snopes," mm-hmm. and people were mocked and ridiculed for it? So if the question is, do I believe that they're bastions of this kind of uh, Herculean objectivity, this dispassionate thing where they is very scientifically separate themselves mm-hmm. and just look at the facts? I don't know. I don't know of any, but they're grand political they're one like that. Wildly better than anyone else. That's the the meant to be made is are they are they impeccable? No, you can be are biased they, and still are they do good. Eight out of ten, yeah. So, yeah. am I willing to take eighty percent, eighty percent correct on wiping out terrible, bad, utterly fake news like CO two emissions don't cause climate change type bad news? Um, like when I mean seriously, yeah. What and the other thing is, whose opinion is it going to change? No one's. We, if you know anything about cognitive bias, having a disputed tag on your news isn't going to stop your uncle from posting that climate change ain't real article from from <clears throat> from climate change is a hoax from the Chinese dot com. It's not going to stop him from sharing that. Yeah, well, it will though. Facebook users who try to share a disputed article. Are asked if they're sure they want to share it, so it's not going to stop and, him. And they will; they'll say yes. It'll put up a roadblock because he'll say just what you said, which right. is the liberal. The, I mean, not in not as articulate and not as understanding as you are to the concept, but they'll say the same thing. Snopes is a liberal bias news source, so I don't care what they say if it's disputed; it's still a fact. Political fact is a disputed liberal news source, so I don't care what they say; it's still a fact. There, this will stop no one from crap news. I like how they at least, um, whenever somebody gets flagged as disputed, that there's going to be a link to an article explaining why. I like that. That's a good thing, you know. Yes. And the stories that have been disputed will also get pushed down in the news feed. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's it's a new thing. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to. And hey, look, we'll see. We we know that there are there are labels that you can look at and say, we know that there's been some 
Democratic lies that are easy to find. Let's see if they get disputed. So when they when you go into one that has someone sharing a thing about Obama saying, if you can if you want your health care, you can keep it. See if that becomes disputed news or not. If it doesn't, then you know you've got a bias. If it does, then we're playing ball. Now, I I honestly think that I'm taking a li- I'm taking a very conservative angle here and saying that if your job is to be a news source, or if your job is to fact check news, then your number one goal is to be as legitimate at that as you can be, as opposed to bias, because your job isn't to give news. Your job is to evaluate it. So you'll still have a spin, but your your end game responsibility is if Snopes has two or three more people do that, Snopes as a credibility machine is done. It's over. They only need one or two more people to act that way before people laugh it entirely off the stage and something else will replace it. So I I, I have kind of a conservative viewpoint of saying that for those, for fact-checking industries and businesses, that there's an incentive to try to be as right as you can or else you can get bumped out. I'm interested to see what they qualify as news. Because yeah. if they if they flag if they don't flag things like Bill O'Reilly or Rachel Maddow, just because they're established, just because they're established. I mean, that's what I'm saying too. Like, I mean, you look at those are legacy institutions, Fox, and look, 21st Century Fox. Why is how is 21st Century Fox even still on Facebook when they just get busted recently for having literally created tons of fake news websites? To yes. promote their movie. Tons of fake Tons news. Tons of fake news. Web- and I saw some of these articles shared. I saw them in my news feed. I didn't share any of these articles. But I saw some of these articles in my news feed. And I'm like, what's this What's this nonsense all about? And then come to find out, bada boom, bada bing, it was created. And they said, oh, we, we did this trying to promote the show. Oops, we'll never do this again. Oopsie-poopsie. You created a whole bunch of these. You're an organization that created a ton of fake web, fake news websites. And, and yet you're still ro- rolling around, you yeah. know, as if you're normal. You've got you got uh, um, the five. If the five is treated like news, then this whole endeavor is a joke. You can just throw pointer and everybody else right out the window and say, dude, if that's treated like news, it's it's opinion. Yeah. We've said this on the show. We've said before that they should take off the news symbol on the bottom during the opinion section. Yes. They should. Or just have Fox News opinion, MSNBC opinion. Yeah. They which, should have that on the screen. Which would solve it. I, and I think I think when it's talking about philosophical positions in politics, there isn't, there isn't a line. You can't decipher fact from fiction. But there is a factual number about how many people have immigrated into the United States from mm-hmm. Mexico. That's not a fake number. Like, there's a real number. It's there. a fluctuating it's not, one. It's a fluctuating yeah, one. Yeah, Hillary said 16,000 or 16 real, million. It's a real one. Right. It, well, and that's the whole thing is – uh, for me, is we do need clarity, clarity between Pew Research poll that says net zero immigration, literally net zero, as of a couple years 16 ago, sixteen million, and it didn't jump sixteen million in two years. So even yeah, five million. Somebody's off by a lot. Somebody is off by a lot. A grandiose number. Mm-hmm. Who and, and I think it would be an all right thing for clarity in there because I, I think to be quite frank, um, the regular public and social discourse isn't going to come to a conclusion on that. The people that think it's 16 million will always think it's 16 million. The people think it's net zero will always think it's net zero. Doesn't matter what the new. Pe- They're not even going to come to an agreement over what news is, and that's th- this is the this is where it gets risky, man. Is that if in the the article kind of alludes to this too, is that Facebook doesn't want to get in that mix. They're, they're hesitant to even do it. They don't want to get in and say, "Well, we're going to choose this and that," because when they do that, they're essentially becoming gatekeepers. And in, you know, or a.k.a. the people who decide what is going to be in the newspaper, the people who decide what's going to be in the magazine, the yeah. people who decide what's going to be on the TV because there's there are limited spaces, limited mediums and the like. So people will judge a an enterprise. They'll judge Fox News based on what kind of stories make it through. What kind of stories make it through? Who makes those decisions? The same thing with MSNBC. F- Facebook has not had that problem because Facebook has just had this this laissez faire. You you put something out, it plays itself out in this but marketplace. Is that a is but, that a better way? Like for instance, many people will tell you that journalism was better in the seventies, and that did have an editing crew, and that did have people that regulated what got in the newspaper, and they didn't say that the guy in the corner that has an end times prophecy is going to get an opinion section in the newspaper, but he gets an opinion section on Facebook. 
And so, I mean, but I wouldn't. For, I don't know if I would say that that's because of the gatekeepers. I mean, because if this is true, then what we have is we now have a pool of people that that it got big and got big because everybody's able to say their opinions, and then the dude at the top goes, "Listen, we are now going to function more like a magazine where I'm the editor now." And I decide what is going to find its way here, yeah. what's going to push itself down. At that point, you're, it, you are a newspaper, and that's what their fear is. That's what they're afraid mm-hmm. of that because they know at that point, then people have the right to say, I don't like the editorial aspect of what you're doing any more than I like the editorial aspect of Fox. And for people who want to know what that means, go find that movie called Outfoxed. Well, and I think Watch I, it. I totally agree. I, I think the other angle, it too, is. Um, that when I was young and I heard about the internet and this idea, this grand exchange of ideas, I was excited because I thought in the end game that good ideas would win out. But that's not true. Bad ideas persist just as just alongside good ideas. Contradicting ideas are held at the same time by people in many cases. People are not very good at disseminating or figuring out what is true from what is false. Um, and I think that it, maybe this is just cynicism here, but... I don't know that giving everyone a platform to have an equal and just see whatever whatever bad ideas or good ideas come out of it in the hash out. Um, I'm starting to be skeptical about good ideas winning that argument anymore. I just don't. I just don't know that it's inevitably true that the better ideas yeah. win the win the day. I don't believe that's the case. I would believe though that it would be better in a field where people compete and debate and try at least to win on merit of points. That if they do lose, that they keep trying. And rather than resort to a very top-down authoritarian thing that places uh, an imprimatur in the hands, a censor in the hands of someone like Mark Zuckerberg. That's true. Yeah. We'll be right back right after this. Don't go anywhere. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them. You hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. It's coming down to the wire, bro. Yeah, right down to it. Right down to it. We're in the last segment of this edition of Paleo Radio. Is it? Is it edition number 69, Joe? I think we are on 69. I think, I think, we're, <laughs> I think we're on 69. I couldn't help it. Yeah, we had to do that joke. All right. WikiLeaks CIA dump gives Russian hacking deniers a, the perfect ammo. This is by Wired. And just so people know, Wired uh, takes a position uh, like the intelligence community, by and large, yeah. uh, their official yeah. stuff. Um, so this is an interesting piece by them. They said, never accuse WikiLeaks of getting its timing wrong. Last <laughs> fall, the group perfectly paced its steady drip of John Podesta's emails to undermine Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. Now, as the Capitol thrums with chaos— I like the use of the word thrum. Yeah, that's great. It has unleashed a cloud of confusion that makes it hard for experts to discern the facts and easy for non-experts to see whatever they want. That's a g- very well written. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It says, two days earlier, President Trump baselessly tweeted that the Obama administration had wiretapped Trump Tower, a theory that first emerged on a conservative talk radio show. And I wanted to – I put in the notes here. I put – there's no link to that claim – um, about where it began, and I, I wondered if it emerged in part two from the New York Times headline during the coverage of Flynn talking about did. how yeah how they got that through wiretapping. Yeah. I don't think it came from nowhere. I no, I totally agree with that. The other thing too is I, I would not be. This is entirely an opinion based by Joe Elder here, but that would not blow my socks off to find out that Obama had wiretapped everything, like the not, oh, yeah. not, not Obama, but just the fact that. The administration and what we're finding out already from Vault 7 is that the massive. idea that something like that being done is very lowball. I mean, yeah, and just so everybody not, knows. It's not out of the top. I haven't jumped in neck deep on this yet, man. I, I've been enjoying drawing. Good. Sketching, using graphite and lead. Yeah. You know, and, and seriously, man, just eating some lead paint. Yeah, you know, eating some lead paint. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing that just over the relaxing. week, everybody. Yeah, I've been doing that. One nugget of particular interest to Trump supporters is a section entitled Umbridge that details the CIA's ability to impersonate cyber attack techniques used by Russia and other nation states. Mm -hmm. In theory, that means the agency could have faked digital forensic fingerprints to make Russians look guilty of hacking the Democratic National Committee. Mm -hmm. Nothing Nothing in the documents connects the CIA to any Trump Tower wiretaps which may or may not have ever existed at all anyway. 
nor does the leak provide any evidence of a CIA scheme to pin the DNC hack on the Russians. But in the Internet age, it doesn't need to. Oh, no. I, it, all it needs is the plausibility. Well, and you know, but it doesn't it, though? Well, I, I mean, mean, isn't that in reality? It, 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 kind of going back to the beginning of this, when saying, um, you know, it's hard for... There's this cloud of confusion, the, the sentence we actually liked. Now as the Capitol thrums with chaos, it has unleashed a cloud of confusion that makes it hard for experts to discern the facts. That's that's a, a real scenario we're now in. Okay. It makes it hard yeah. for experts to discern the facts, which, but more, as the nature of the situation yes. is, makes it easy for non-experts. to. Yes. See, but that's what happens in any situation where facts are hard to discern. It, it does. Right. But, and that's the, that's very true. I, I'm not saying that uh, that it, it doesn't open up some questions to it, but I have very high confidence that it will shatter nothing about the I, – I, it didn't shake me in my space boots about thinking Russia hacked it based on what Russia has been doing in Europe, let alone in the United States, it, it, ignoring U.S. capabilities or even acknowledging U.S. capabilities um, – You'd have to get into a grandiose conspiracy saying the U.S. is faking their Russia while hacking European countries, too. I mean, that's a to, – to make it fall in line with where my that's line part of thinking of it. is. That's, that's part of it is that we – you know, and I, as I said, I haven't, I haven't delved into this the way that I did during the election. I, I don't know if I have the emotions for it right now, mm. but I just don't. Or the time. Yeah. I'm a busy dude, you know, super busy. I would love to, to study up more on this, but – while the scope of the intelligence community's spying capabilities may stun, the news about the country's ability to forge evidence shouldn't because it isn't really news at all. And that's – we've discussed this. You and I have disagreements and debates over this. And in those disagreements and debates, that's the very issue that I have brought up. I, mm-hmm. I've, I've brought this up for a while and said, man, you know, back in – back during the election, they, there was a, a releasing of um, – a number of servers mm-hmm. around the world that were compromised yeah. uh, that we were using and that was giving signals that appeared to be something other than what it really was. And so like, that's not new, but to a lot of people it's brand spanking new. Like they just don't, oh, yeah. they don't read about this stuff. Yes. Sadly, they don't listen to the show. Well, and I think <laughs> right. a, a people are they zero sum about it though. They believe that because the U S has it, that other groups don't. And that's, that's the falsehood. Who's the, what is the second best espionage agency in the world it's the fsb out of the kremlin they, by far there's number one and number two are the u.s and, and russia so the question is per the hacking there's two states that are very capable of doing it per the hacking what is is the hacking benefiting one group over the other and why would th- this is the legitimate question why would the cia want to throw their own people into this much of a tizzy off of a false flag internally I mean, does it make more sense that they would want to do that or that Russian hacking would want to do that? That would be a good debate. That would be a good debate. It would be interesting to see, like, what's on the line. Why 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 would would, America want to shut down Ukraine's power system in the middle of a civil war with Russia? Why would they want to do that? Why would they want to hack Estonia's uh, data and get only Russian-speaking citizens from Estonia? Like, why would the U.S. hackers to just pin it on Russia? Or, like, what would be their serious intel reasons for wanting to do that as opposed to other hackers it, it's it's outside of what we're talking about here today but it's it's just something that's worth noting is what's the action of the hacks right? the, the tools can cover hackers tracks or make attacks look like they come from other sources as in a murder trial where a dirty cop could plant a weapon to frame an innocent person intelligence agencies could plant evidence to mislead the u.s public mm-hmm. devious definitely but it's not new again this is this is part of this is part of the framework when people ask me, they say, well, why don't you trust the CIA or why don't you trust this? B- because none of that stuff is new. That's right. Like that stuff is this very, very old. That has been around for a very long time. And security experts, they say that. That may be obvious to security experts, but the American public isn't made up of that, not even close. Mm-hmm. It's made up of people who are rightly afraid the government is messing with them. Americans struggle to sort through the confusing Often contradictory information speeding toward them. It's information uh, made more confusing by both its technical details and a polarized media environment that often prioritizes sensation over facts and clear thinking. Yes, I, I agree with that. Too. Totally true. Yeah. This, uh, this report doesn't scare me at all in terms of being worried about the facts behind who's doing these hacks. 
It, it just doesn't. <laughs> and that, that's that's why for the that's why exactly what we're talking about. I'm not an expert in cybersecurity. And shock horror, my opinion has not deviated one bit from this. Just like people who think that Russia didn't do it are excited about this article. They're just as excited as I am not interested in it. I mean, that's 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 the natural state of how news is. There, you know, this is a this is a it's a for I would say layman people. It's a chink in the armor for the security administrations for them to use it as their argument, and for people that know a little bit about cybersecurity, it's not news at all. Like, I mean, when people say that Vault Seven, I've been reading about it with WikiLeaks when the CIA or they can turn on your phone, turn off your phone. These these are facts. This is what yeah. they can do. Um, that Zuckerberg sh- puts tape on his video camera yeah. on his laptop. That should surprise no one that read mm-hmm. what Edward Snowden said about the capabilities of the NSA and the in other institutions in the U.S. Um, but it's the CIA. It's the CIA. And that's that's troublesome. Yeah, yeah. That's not. I mean, it, yeah. all those agencies do work together to act like the NSA doesn't work covertly with the CIA would be kind of ignorant on our part. I think. Sure. You know that they don't have access. But, this, to the same but well, but this was apparently this was something that very minimal oversight at all, or even knowledge. Yeah, this at is all. a whole. This, this is, is a whole. I mean, it's you know, it's not a. This good is thing. a rogue thing. It is. And and it's out of control. Yes, and that it's not only rogue, but then they lost kind of the handles on it. Yeah, and hey, playing a little bit of the conspiracy angle to this too is the first art. The first line of this sentence or the article I loved: "Never accuse WikiLeaks of getting its timing wrong." Mm-hmm. Which when we when we first post about this, uh, you and I were talking on Facebook, and I I posted a link or I just posted a comment saying, "Notice how WikiLeaks has never really released with perfect timing FSB document dumps." Or if they, I mean, I'm I've still been waiting for them. We're on year eight now. Of I mean, and may and maybe the Russians are just hella good at hiding their documents, and the U.S. is sloppy. Maybe so. I mean, but how yeah. how do you figure? How, how do you figure that WikiLeaks has not released sensitive information about the FSB and all the information that they have gained from American intelligence? And I'm not saying that they're dirty players. I'm just saying is, see, we've made them mad is before. It, is it because, though, is it because Russia is even better at espionage and cybersecurity than we are? Or if if it is Russia giving stuff to WikiLeaks, if that is the source of these things, um, that they're simply utilizing that source. Yeah, you know, American American people tend to go to New York Times, WAPO, you know. Whereas, but, but I then mean, you hey, can't don't claim that you're a open, transparent state if you're not interested in getting information from one that helps you. I mean, f- interesting enough. Like if if they're sitting there saying we're we're all about transparency, we're willing to be open to it. Um, there are some connections, and we can talk about this, baby. We won't have enough time in the next couple of minutes. But there's some obvious connections since Edward Snowden moved to Russia between WikiLeaks and the Kremlin working together, too. WikiLeaks even had a show on state-sponsored Russian television. I mean, that's – that's. imagine how much – I don't push that very far. Well, but how much would you yeah. trust a transparent news agency that worked with the American government directly and, and had a show? They were they were about global transparency. They promised to it. It was a guy out of he say he lived in Ecuador, but he lives in uh, just out of the United States. Works with the United States state funded news programming and says he's transparent. You Great question. Him? We'll have time to debate it online. Make sure to go to facebook.com slash paleo radio. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this subject. It's not going away. No, there's going to be plenty more to this. So yes. speculation aside, we're going to get a lot more to it. I don't have anything coming up this week with speaking engagements. I don't know about you, Joe. Nope, no no speaking engagements for me just old paleo radio all right thank you so much for joining the show we had a great time make sure to come back next week on monday 10 to noon check us out on itunes and spreaker and we hope you have a great night we'll see you guys next week